Thank you and welcome to our webinar. This is a joint presentation by the International IVF Initiative and the New England Fertility Society. My name is Evelyn Newber and I'm a longtime member of the society. NEFS is an inclusive, voluntary, nonprofit organization providing continuing education to infertility professionals in and around the New England area. It was founded in 1988 by Dr. Selwyn Oskowitz. We host four meetings per year, three are dinner meetings in the Boston, Massachusetts area. The meeting format begins with a cocktail reception followed by an invited speaker during dinner. The speakers are leaders in the field as the bar was set high with Jock Cohen having been among our, one of our first speakers and continues every time with excellent speakers on a wide variety of topics. The fourth meeting we host is a two-day annual meeting at one of our historical hotels <coughs> in the New England area. We've held meetings in Maine, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. The meetings begin on a Friday night with the reception and the Selwyn Oskowitz lecture takes place during dinner. Then there's a full program of speakers on Saturday. It does include several breaks for connecting with colleagues as well as with the participating industry sponsors. One of the highlights is also hearing from the two winners of the fairing sponsored first or second year MD fellow grants. Faring through the New England Fertility Society sponsors two $10,000 grants for research that is open to our members. The winning fellows have one year to complete the work and then present their findings at our annual meeting. The day ends with a fun theme party. Since the meetings usually takes place in the first weekend in May, we have celebrated the Kentucky Derby, complete with hats and mint juleps, Cinco de Mayo, again with hats and margaritas, and may the fourth be with you, complete with one of our board members dressing up as Darth Vader. I would like to invite everyone to our meeting next spring in Providence, Rhode Island, with the theme of Life's a Beach, fingers crossed in person. Please check out our website at www.nefs.org. Now I would like to turn it over to Paula Duan, our current president. Thank you, Evelyn. Welcome to the 24th session of the International IVF Initiative, or I3, and the first New England Fertility Society, or NEFS, virtual meeting. Hello everyone, my name is Paula Duan, and I'm the current president of the New England Fertility Society. I3 is honored to provide the reproductive community during these unprecedented times with a platform for continued education and collaboration to help you stay engaged, productive, and in touch with others in the IVF community worldwide through webinars and online materials in an array of relevant topics. We are so happy to have you join all of us. It has been an honor and a privilege for the New England Fertility Society to partner with I3. We would like to encourage all professional organizations, if you haven't already done so, to join the I3 initiative and as other local, national, and international groups have done. As a reminder, I3 is a neutral organization with the prime mission to serve you, the reproductive community. So please let I3 know which topics you're interested in and how they, they can be of help. All of the I3 webinars are recorded and posted on their website, should you want to revisit them or if you missed any of the previous sessions. Currently, we have over 800 people registered for today's session from around the world. We encourage all of you to use the question and answer function to ask questions and to avoid using the chat feature for questions as our panelists will not be monitoring the chat. We will try to address as many questions as possible during today's session. The remaining questions will be posted on the I3 website after the fact. I'd like to take a moment, um, first of all, to thank I3, the International IVF Initiative, for allowing us to um, use their platform and present this as more than just a regional or uh, local meeting. Typically it's just uh, in the New England area, but now I guess we have gone worldwide. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Um, New England Fertility Society has several in industry sponsors who have remained with us um, throughout the pandemic. Um, so at the Emerald level, we have Semaphore, our corporate supporters, our Freedom Fertility Pharmacy, Merck, New England Surrogacy, Village Fertility Pharmacy, and the friends of the society are Embryotech, 
Fujifilm Irvine and Seattle Sperm Bank. In order to encourage participation in the New England Fertility Society, um, please go to our website, www.nefs.org. Also, after the meeting, you will be able to access evaluation forms, but they will also be emailed to you. So again, the New England Fertility Society website is www.nefs.org. We'd also like you to visit our website and click on our virtual exhibit hall um, to find out more from our sponsors. Thank you to all the NEFS sponsors um, in attendance tonight. We appreciate your continued support. We look forward to our future meetings and partnering, partnering with I3 again. So our subsequent meetings, um, we place our quarterly meetings, which will be on September 23rd and December 3rd, 2020. I'd like to introduce our first speaker. We have two speakers this evening. Our first speaker is Dr. Andrea Braverman. Dr. Braverman is a clinical professor with a joint appointment in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine at Thomas Jefferson University. Dr. Braverman is the Associate Director for the Educational Corps for OBGYN and also serves as the Director of the College Learning Environment for the University. She is a health psychologist with a, with a specialty in medical health management, infertility counseling, and third-party reproduction issues. She received her MA, her MS, and her PhD in psychology from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Braverman has lectured internationally on the treatment issues in reproductive medicine before medical and patient audiences. She has conducted research and published numerous articles in medical journals about the psychosocial aspects of infertility, attitudes of parents of children born with the use of ART, issues involved in the decision to end treatment, and psychological issues involved in using third-party donors. Dr. Braverman received the Timothy Jeffries Memorial Award in 2011 for outstanding contributions as a health psychologist from the American Society Psychological Association and the Advocacy Award from the Family Equality Council and Path to Parenthood in 2018. She is the past president of the North American Society for Psychosocial Obstetrics and Gynecology and the past chairperson of the Mental Health Professional Group of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. This evening, Dr. Braverman's topic is donor anonymity and confidentiality in the era of direct-to-consumer DNA testing and social media. Thank you, Dr. Braverman. Immediately following Dr. Braverman's presentation, we will have a question and answer session specifically for her. Okay. Um, well, I am so honored and I am uh, just so pleased to be here with all of you tonight. Um, and I uh, just cannot thank you enough for um, the, this invitation to be your kickoff speaker and uh, for the New England Fertility Society and slightly daunted at the, the, the same time too. So um, the one thing we've all learned from COVID is that there's no um, hiding. So you saw that lovely picture of me with that bright red hair and now um, we can't uh, the, hide from that either. So with that, I am going to move ahead with our talk and these are the learning objectives. You know, what we really want to do is to think about how donor linking can occur through DNA banks and websites. But more importantly, just like we throw the, the, the stone in the pond, let's look at where the ripple goes. Um, and so we're going to look at the dilemmas posed by this donor link uh, contact and not just the dilemmas, but the more the challenges. Um, being a psychologist, we are all about language and dilemmas almost has a negative impact, although we will look at some of the dilemmas that come up. And we're looking, we're also going to also look at the implications for donor linking for all of us in the ART field. So when we think about donor anonymity, I got into the field in the mid 80s, again, proving with my gray hair that I actually um, have those years to, to my credit. 
And what I planned in my, uh, in my journey as a psychologist and a professional was what looked like what you're seeing on your left. But what really happened is what we're seeing on the right. By the way, this often feels like many of our, our journeys these days, what we planned and what actually happened. But with donor anonymity, let's give a little bit of a historical context to it. Because before, certainly from the mental health professional perspective, really the discussion in the 90s well into the, the 2000s was, should, intended, should the parents, the recipient parents, disclose or not disclose to the to their children. And some of this was framed in language around secrecy, you know, all of these different words and people finally sort of settled on disclosure and non-disclosure to really keep the more of any pejorative terms out of it. But the reality is we all got off with uh, the exit for full disclosure. And a lot of that you'll see has to do with just the fact that um, we that DNA direct to consumer DNA testing came along. Ultimately, there is no anonymity anymore, and you can see in some of these publications that leading up to it, um, Bill Schlaff and I published um, just last year uh, in FNS sort of our our uh, uh, white paper, if you will, for why anonymity is no more. But for those of us who remember in the, the old days, you know, anonymity was something actually when I first got into the field in the mid 80s, um, it was something almost it was recommended frequently by physicians to their patients go home, we fixed the, um, the, the infertility and nobody's ever going to know but us when I first started a donor egg program with a group that I was working with in the early 90s. And I am infamous for having placed the first recruiting ad in the Philadelphia area to recruit um, an egg donor. Um, what we, we, the, uh, we just, we never thought about the implications down the road. There was no way I could remember talking with the, the donors saying, there's no way anybody's gonna come back and find you unless we give, you the, give them that information and we're not giving them information. Six months ago, one of those donors, who was one of our first donors, I'd say probably around 1992, emailed me, having found me actually through one of the physicians that I'd also worked with at the time and said, oh, by the way, I just got contacted by one of the, um, the offspring from my donated eggs and I need to talk to somebody about this. How was, how was she found? direct-to-consumer DNA testing, the 23andMe's, the Ancestry.com's uh, in the United States where I live, the, you know, we see ads all the time. I always brace around the holiday time that, oh my goodness, everybody's going to be getting their um, Ancestry.com because they've been flooded with all of the advertisements for it or the 23andMe, you know, I thought I was German, so I wore lederhosen, but now I'm wearing a kilt because I found out differently. I mean, you know, they're, they're silly ads, but they're meant to get people interested. What they don't anticipate is, oh my goodness, I'm gonna find out a little more than I planned. And that's when my phone starts ringing. And um, interestingly enough, even uh, from a colleague and friend of mine, who um, we run in Philadelphia a conference every year just on infertility counseling alone. Um, actually, one of my uh, co-directors is Susan Crocken, who you'll hear from next. And so she attended this conference and she said, little did I think that it applied to me. Sure enough, my brother did one of these tests, gave me one of the tests, and there we were sitting at lunch. And she said, I'm paying for lunch because this is a, about me. And then we went on to, um, talk about how she had just learned at the age of 64 that she was sperm donor conceived. But the other thing, even outside of direct consumer DNA, is the internet. And think about the amount of information, at least here in the United States, that recipients get, um, including in many places for egg and sperm donors, the current pictures. And even though I am not all that tech savvy, I am sure that is a very simple way to find your donor. So image search, I mean, come on, who hasn't Googled themselves at some point and been both in, uh, slightly alarmed with some of the pictures that have uh, come up for them. So, you know, with that as a background, let's think about it. Our focus of attention and concerns have evolved. 
when we started off on this journey in the infertility field, the, the ART was really all about the intended parent. Let's focus on their medical needs. That will sort of solve the psychosocial needs. The donor was just really a, a means to an end. We certainly didn't think about donors' psychosocial needs. And I mean, donor conceived offspring didn't even come on the radar, but it's changed. We don't have a simple arrow. We now have a lovely diagram that doesn't do it justice. In other words, we know how the donor conceived in this, in this picture. We have the intended parents. We have the donor, the donor's children. We have all of us, we have recruiters, uh, the, um, we have gamete banks, we have professional societies, we have the intended parents family, we have the donors family. It's not just these single participants, these single stakeholders, but rather a broad array of stakeholders who are now coming into the picture. Because what we have also learned is that if there is contact through the, um, through the uh, directed DNA testing, often is not the direct contact to the donor, but often through somebody in the donor's family. And it's very interesting. I'm in the middle, I just started a study. I hope to have that information in, within the year about, um, at least among the sperm donors, we're gonna to try to reach out to the egg donors too, about what, how much they are involved in this because we have not, um, we have not heard from them as to what their interest in it is, what their participation is, what's happening. All we have is more anecdotal through the gamete banks and certainly through professionals like myself, where we're getting contacted both by donors who never expected to be contacted and also by donor conceived offspring as they're trying to decide how to do contact. Um, some of them have been an interesting contact. I, so this was 10 years ago where I got contacted by a sperm donor and his wife who had been sent to me by their attorney because he had received a registered um, letter in the mail saying from the sperm bank saying, gosh, there was a letter we received from one of your recipients on behalf of her daughter and would you be interested in responding? Unfortunately, the wife was the one who opened the letter um, in all fairness, they were in the middle of refinancing, uh, not refinancing, yeah, refinancing their house. And on top of it, they were just trying to finish up the papers because they were due with their first child within the week. She opened that up and that is, um, uh, she did not know he had ever been a sperm donor. And so, you know, lots of things just aren't locked down anymore. And it is with all the information and all the things going on more and more porous. I'm probably the only person who thinks during the global pandem pandemic, gosh, this gives people more time at home to, to think about these things and go searching on the internet and do these kits. I think a lot of this is now pushing us to think about what is kinship. Sperm donation certainly has forced us into thinking about this because there are a large number of these half donor half sibling groups. And certainly back in the day, in all fairness, in donor sperm, the thought was nobody was ever going to be able to make contact with each other. Sperm was going to be shipped all over the country, if not the world. So what was the harm? But in, a, in an era of, of information literally being at the, the tips of your fingers where you can make contact, then these sibling groups really have had incredible um, uh, impact, including information sharing. So if I am donor conceived and I find my donor, I can now share that with um, usually many people beyond myself. So even this book, I don't know if any of you have seen it, I've got dibs, donor siblings, diblings, Okay, so now we have a term which I actually kind of think is wonderful because there are new relations, relationships and special relationships and how do we use words? You know, in the old days when I was growing up, we did use words to denote the uh, specific new relationships. For example, many of us growing up, depending on your culture or your experience, grew up with somebody you might have called aunt or uncle who was not a genetic aunt or a, a uncle or one through marriage. It was, a, it was a way of denoting a very special relationship. Well, if I have donor, um, donor conceived genetic half siblings, who are they to me? My favorite quote 
from um, a teenager when finding out that her mother had been an egg donor and that she had genetic half siblings was said the following, huh, mom, they're not siblings, but they're not nothing. And I thought, you know, out of the mouths of kids, she really, uh, she, she nailed it. That's exactly right. What are they? We also know genetics aren't neutral, and the, uh, Jean Benward, who was really the, the author behind this, this um, sentence, genetic heritage is an important influence in temperament, appearance, abilities, and other personal traits. These biologically based experiences of the self are important com components of an individual's identity. In other words, we use a lot of language, and particularly in the United States, of, hey, love makes a family. But what we can't do is kick genetics to the curb. In other words, it, it, there, there is a confluence of all of these, um, these forces in our life and how do we understand it and how are the children going to understand it. As I always, when I am counseling um, in, uh, uh, recipient parents, I will always say to them, you know, we do say to our children, love makes a family. But what's the first thing everybody comments on when they look at the baby, right? Ah, who does the baby look like? And this seems to be true all over the world. So, you know, the, and having proved that at least at one point in my life, I was the redhead and I was truly that redheaded child. You know, I always said if my parents had been uh, donors and you'd looked at their profiles, you would have been very surprised to find the redhead. And I always tell my recipients with a smile and a twinkle in my eye that redheads are terrific. But the point being is I grew up from the time I can remember being asked, oh my goodness, where did that red hair come from? And even the occasional joke of, oh, was it the milkman? Or in today's parlance, probably, was it the cable guy that came around? Or maybe now the cable woman, now that we have donor egg. We can't pretend that genetics are neutral and that therefore, as we move into uh, having more and more donor conceived offspring, we have to look at, again, where did the ripples from the pebble in the, the water go? So what's kinship? I don't know if any of you have seen this. Uh, this was an article a while back, but there are um, companies now that make sperm donor jewelry and it actually has the sperm so the sperm donor number and usually um, the, the sperm bank on it. And um, we're not seeing that for egg donor yet, but we will see. And you know, what we realize is even among us and among the, the parents and among the children, one person's yuck is another person's yum. In other words, what one person finds, absolutely, I would never do that. Another person says that is the most meaningful thing to me. Um, there's a group called Anonymous Us, some of you might be aware of, and these are donor conceived people that think anonymity has truly been uh, the, the biggest force and negative force in their lives. We have the donor sibling registry, which is still the largest self registry of people co making connections through um, either being donors, parents, or donor conceived. And we all have different opinions. So now like donor sibling registry already gives you an opinion. It gives you a bias, it gives you a value. Donor sibling registry. Sibling saying, I believe that biological, uh, that genetic connections is, uh, makes for kinship. Whereas others would say, I would not call that a sibling. I would call that, a, uh, that is somebody who I'm genetically connect, connected to. And I have these conversations every week with intended parents and they are not all singing in, in unison, occasionally in harmony, often in dissonance. We as, in, as professionals are definitely experiencing new concepts. This is from the donor sibling uh, registry uh, 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 website and it shows what they, how they view us. That, you know, here we are, you know, just sort of thinking that we are safe behind the wall that we've built and we've locked off information and here comes the wave of DNA technology to knock it all over. So again, we are not, uh, the, the, the industry is often not portrayed positively. And so I would argue it's really important to understand our own reactions. 
um, you know, here they are all suited up and our friend comes in with their bunny slippers on and says, they're for my emotional protection. And I think sometimes we do suit up and occasionally I would argue we do, it's okay that we put on our bunny slippers to protect ourselves emotionally. You know, we beg a lot of questions with all of this. If we're talking about DNA, uh, opening things up, we have to think about what the donor's role is in the family. What is the donor's expectation and the intended parent's expectation, let alone the donor conceived person's expectations. And that's what DCP stands for, donor conceived person. Um, you know, in other words, are they aligned? I still see that, you know, that we, with both any of the gamete banks, some of them are very clear. Is this an ID, uh, identity open kind of donor? Is this a donor that is still, and people are still using the word anonymous when, and then they sort of, you know, backpedal from that. Well, you're not really anonymous. When we all know that donors are, if we can find them in 2020 now, and certainly after the, the, the child is born, you know, a parent can find that, that donor. And I have seen people with children as young as toddlers having sent things off to these DNA companies and finding their egg donors. Um, and then even within um, the Philadelphia area, I had one person who was on one of these um, either Facebook groups or uh, one of the groups that is made for connecting she found another uh, parent, just they figured it out that they went to the same um, ART clinic. They used the same egg donor and the one woman found the, the donor, the, woman, the, the mom that I was working with had not planned to do this, but once that information was there, as she said, how do I turn my, my close my eyes to it? And then eventually she was very able <laughs> There were, there were some interesting things going on here, but the other mom um, told, gave her all the information, said, I won't give you the identity, but I'll give you all the information I had. My patient was able to identify who the donor was and then said to me, well, like, do I need to share this with my children? I'm now keeping it from them. Her children, two and a half years old. I did share with her that her children were two and a half years old and perhaps she wasn't keeping that information from them at the, at the moment. So when we talk about roles, you know, is the role, if there is contact, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but if there's contact at two and a half, that's very different from contact at 20, age 20 and a half, right? What does the extended family views and influences mean? I am working with a sperm donor right now who is, you know, probably around 40-ish would be my guess. And he, he was um, contacted by the first um, uh, of his donor conceived offspring and they are about to turn 18. Um, interestingly, brother and sister who were both, uh, both double, don do double donor, both egg and sperm donor. And um, it, the biggest issue for him grappling with now is his extended family views and the influences because once again, siblings speak differently than his parents who feel differently from friends. Interestingly, friends were also at the same fraternity and were also start, were about worrying that they were gonna be contacted. Lots of influences here. And also do different family types offer different dynamics and roles for the donor. If you are a single mom or dad by choice and you're using a gamete donor, does that set up a different dynamic than if you are a same sex couple, uh, heterosexual or an opposite sex couple, if you're older parents, so you have transgenerational uh, donation or even transracial. We can't stick our heads in the sand and say that, that these issues will not be a role in the dynamics of if donor conceived offspring may be curious and trying to make contact or, or at least just finding out more information by this direct to, to consumer DNA testing. And look, we're in 2020. And I always tell my patients now, I'm gonna be retired by the time you're coming back to me to talk to, you, to me about your kids and this. But, I, and I say, I'm passing it on to my younger colleagues, you're welcome. But you know, I think it is more thinking about these impacts, how we, counsel and teach. And that is really going to be the chorus of my song today.
we have to think about age and stage of contact, and that by stage, I mean stage of development. So age and stage. Does this, this was a case that made a lot of uh, press. Uh, single mom by choice, her then I believe five-year-old daughter, Susan may be referencing this in her talk, but the daughter expressed curiosity about the donor. Mom uh, reached out to one of these direct-to-consumer DNA companies, was able to um, make connections with a family member of the sperm donor, not the sperm donor directly, when the family member let the sperm donor know about this contact, I always say it shouldn't be surprising, but the donor didn't react um, all that, <laughs> that positively, and hence all of the hullabaloo, um, because here in the United States, when there's hullabaloo, we sue everybody. Um, so um, you know, the, this is not, from a psychologist's point of view, nobody won here. What was the initial goal? If the initial goal is to help the donor conceived offspring get information, mom didn't help the, this the child by not thinking through implications of reaching out at this young age, certainly not thinking about the donors and what the donors agreed to, whatever the gamete bank. If the donor agreed to contact at age 18 and you're violating that contact, what does that mean? Also, just even thinking about the donor and all of this, if the donor, whether it be an egg or a sperm donor, most of them have multiple um, donor-conceived offspring. And just even the dynamics of that first contact versus the sixth or the 16th or the 26th, all of this has impact. But let's think about age and st stage of development. For those of you who took psychology 101 in college or in high school, you know, we remember good old Piaget, and this is not to do a whole uh, lecture on cognitive development. This is to make everybody remember, hey, right, what we understand, how our thinking is, is very different at different ages. We don't think abstractly at age seven. We think abstractly usually from 12 years on to adulthood. And certainly adolescence brings up much more of a range of development too. Just like we expect kids to crawl at different uh, ages, the same thing with all of these types of uh, development. And come on, let's face it, we all work with people who we still think are very adolescent and develop, uh, are developing. But it's not just cognitive development, it's moral development. And those of you who remember Col Kohlberg or uh, Carol Gilligan's, um, theories. I mean, just even the, at the bottom of your slide, look at Car Carol Gilligan and the idea of stages of development. You know, the I love me to I love you to I love you more than me. And then finally to hopefully I love myself and you. Again, that's what we strive for, um, but doesn't always happen. We are always in essence balancing needs. The needs of the donor conceived with the needs of the donors and I would argue now even the needs of all these other stakeholders we talked about earlier. And we know that perspectives can differ. Whether you think it's deep or whether you think it's not is frequently where you happen to be standing. So going forward from here, we all remember the par parable of the blind man and the, uh, and the elephant, you know, asking to say, what do you have when you know you have it in your hand? And this is a snake if you're holding the trunk. And this is um, you know, um, a rope if you're holding the, the tail. It just, we are so convinced we know what we have, but really going forward, we have to take a step back and say, we are no longer, this is not your, 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 your mother or father's uh, gamete donation anymore. This is a new dawn that we've stepped into. We know that just because parents can doesn't mean that they should. You know, the, this is a little funny haha -ha of saying down below, just because doesn't mean that it's a good idea to do. But this is also applies to parents and donor conceived persons. They can make contact with donors at any time, but we have to think about the social contract between the donor uh, and the intended parents and having the opposite of the intention. Everybody is, is, has to, we have to think about everybody in the, this um, arena now. Parents do have a choice of what type of contact they select. If they select a donor that is anonymous, they can't then uh, 
um, be surprised that they're not having contact. If it is important to you to think about that responsibility to your child, um, and you then you have to make a decision that goes beyond, uh, goes um, into the future, and will and they can sustain that decision over time. Uh, you know what? I picked an honest donor, but eh, changed my mind. I think it's better for them to have contact. No, you know, we have to back them up to say, let's think about these decisions now. We used to do it with blood type. If you don't pick a donor with a matching, with a, with a matching appropriate blood type, this is a way a child could find out. We need to turn that on its head and say, you really need to think about what structure of donation we're doing. Um, and the parents, it, the parents' perceptions of their child's needs doesn't automatically supersede the interests of the donor and his or her family. They have, you know, they need to be considered in this. Laws govern action, but not feelings. Contracts fail to regulate behavior, and they certainly do not regulate feelings and emotions. So you can't unring a bell after contact is made. So even if you have a remedy, and Susan can, uh, Parkin can talk about this, about financial damages and all of that, this is most likely going to be inadequate or unsatisfactory. If I want my child to have a, a good a positive experience with the donor, but you know, it, it doesn't work out that way because I've made contact in some way that violates whatever understanding um, they have or our idea of roles aren't aligning, it's just not going to meet that goal of having a positive experience. The contracts that we form when they sign uh, contracts or consent forms inform the roles that the stakeholders can anticipate for themselves or their respective families. And if you can't find a decent remedy, let's consider another perspective. Working through a gamete bank may offer parents better chances of getting the information or setting up the relationships they want than going through this direct consumer testing or other directed efforts. And we do have an opportunity to talk to this, talk about this when we meet with the parents and also with the donors. I know this may sound like a, a, a plea for full employment for mental health professionals, but it is a shameless plea for let us do this exploration. Um, we can help align expectations, all of us together, create a more successful context for future success rather than failure by discussing these issues in the recipients prior to donation. Feelings are not, not, don't translate necessarily into rights or wrongs. Competing rights talk, my rights, is not helpful in a highly emotional and roiling pot of competing interests. Invoking a right as a rationale for a behavior can be dangerous because the action directly pits one person's need against those of another, donor versus donor conceived, parents versus children, and fundamentally claims preeminence. But it doesn't get you back to what I was saying, the goal, find the goal. You can force contact, you just can't force a relationship. So ultimately, two thongs don't make a right. In other words, two wrongs don't make a right. Um, and we certainly see that here. You just can't stick your hand in, head in the sand and hope it's all gonna go away. It's a new reality of non-anonymity and it needs to be explained to everybody, to everybody going forward. And I will argue better informed stakeholders ensures the best relationships going forward. So counseling, 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 all of us together, all of us singing in unison and as well as in harmony because each of us has a different role from counselor to physician to nurse to lab, it does not matter. We all need to be speaking with the, the, in this, with the same voice, helping to educate and support. Um, you know, we don't need models that are inflexible. There's no one size fits all in life. I'm gonna argue you can't legislate feelings or behaviors. So to my colleagues around the world that have a very different setup than we have in the United States, you know, these kits can be ordered from anywhere. And so we are all in this, just like the pandemic has said, we are all in this globally. So are we in this as a global endeavor. We must do more prospective research, retrospective research is just not the answer and we must evolve beyond convenient samples. We have an obligation to the future and all the, st the stakeholders from the start, from egg and sperm to all the way to all of the, even into our,
uh, advancing years. And I'm going to end on that and thank you all for your attention and your patience. Great. Thank you very much. That was a lot of things to think about on, on that. So we have a few questions. Um, the first question is from, um, from somebody who's on a sperm donor, a sperm bank. Uh, from the perspective of the bank, either of the sperm or egg donor, how do you really help protect the donors more? So from the, the point of view of the clinics who are working with the donors. Well, I don't think we can help them retrospectively, and, but I'll answer about our older donors in a minute. I think prospectively, I think we, that you have, anybody who is saying that you are not going to be known, it, you're, you're not, it, it, you shouldn't be doing that. Let me just put it bluntly. That's not, that's not right. They need to know that they can be found. They need to know what they're signing up for, both for themselves, for their children, because their children are going to be genetic half-siblings and probably have contact with all this, uh, all of these genetic half-siblings. But for our older donors, uh, I will quote the gentleman that was the 40-year-old sperm donor was saying to me, I need somebody to tell me how to navigate this. I think our next step is to really think about how we counsel these donors to handle contact what's fair to them, you know, this, this is a good man. He was talking to me about the moral dilemmas of wanting to do the right thing, but not writing an emotional blank check for the rest of his life. He knew he had over 50 donor conceived offspring from his donation. So again, I think we have to be fair, reasonable, help people learn how to communicate. That's how we best protect our sperm donors, not to tell them that we can protect them from something that is already happening. All right. Okay, we have a second question. Does the end of anonymity mean a major change in donor recruiting and counseling? How has this worked in other countries? For instance, Sweden, where anonymity for sperm donors was ended legally in the early 1980s. It's a great question. I mean, I would leave it to my colleagues from other countries to talk about their own personal experiences. What, but what I've read in the literature is that we've certainly seen a, a dip downward and then sort of a climbing back. I can only speak directly to my experience in the United States is that I think these younger donors are coming in and their concept of just how information is, is entirely different from certainly my generation's understanding. So when you say to them, gosh, you know, your information is out there, they're like, oh yeah, sure, no, that makes sense. And then the ones that follow through are very comfortable with this. And that's both with egg and sperm donors that, we, that I've talked to. So I think what we're seeing is both a generational shift, just a whole orientation shift, shift to the donor. And I think also donors pick up our own anxiety. So, you know, I think if we're going and saying this works great, you know, then, you know, how would you handle, how do you think about it? Then I think they are, I think we are seeing less that fling of I'll never do this. But with that is also them understanding that there could be not just one knock on the door, but multiple knocks on the door. Mm -hmm. So in one the, more. Uh, I think in the essence of time, we're gonna move on to the next speaker. Um, and we're gonna allow Andrea to um, return to her vacation. Thank you, Andrea, for um, an enlightening talk and for taking time out of your vacation to spend with us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. So our second speaker of the evening is Susan Crocken. Susan is a uh, lawyer specializing in reproductive law at Crocken Law and Policy Group, uh, formerly in Newton, Massachusetts, currently in Washington, DC. She is a senior scholar and adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center and a research assistant professor at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown University. She's a former adjunct professor at Northeastern University School of Law in Boston, Massachusetts. She is the author and contributor to numerous publications and she is the recipient of numerous awards, most recently the 2019 Resolve Hope Award honoree. Susan established Crocken Law Policy Group in Massachusetts in 1988, ironically, the same year that the New England Fertility Society, formerly known as the Boston Fertility Society, was established. Susan was an early and longstanding member of the New England Fertility Society before relocating to Washington, DC. 
and she held the executive board position of member at large. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce Susan Kraken, and the topic of her presentation is Legally Speaking 2020, an update on ART law. Thanks, Paul, very much. Can... I'm delighted to be here virtually. And I will share my screen. So please just bear with us for a moment. There we go. Great. Okay, well, first of all, Paul and Michelle and all of you all at NEFS, I, my hat's off to you for pulling this off. These are extraordinary times and what you're doing is remarkable and I'm delighted and honored to be part of it. So thank you for including me and I hope everybody is staying safe and sane. Um, I had a lot of options that I could have chosen this evening when I was asked to talk about an update on art law. And since I don't think any of you want to attend my class that goes for an entire semester, even if it's on Zoom these days, I'm going to try to shorten this to a few really um, current issues if I can. And so my goal this evening is first I have nothing to disclose except that I am trying to stay safe, safe and have healthy and sane and learn to use Zoom constantly. And the learning objectives essentially I have are that I'd like to talk about what's new in reproductive tissue storage and disposition and that's embryos, eggs and sperm. I want to talk about what's new in surrogacy with an emphasis on COVID and international surrogacy. And I wanted to touch on the new and current issues that I see in posthumous reproduction and posthumous extraction all through a legal lens. So it's an ambitious agenda and we'll see what we get through this evening. Um, there's a very famous quote I love to start with, the in vitro genie is out of the bottle and you can't put it back. It comes from a gestational surrogacy case in California. And you know, we, none of us want to in this field. We are all doing, I hope, together, wonderful work creating families, but it's a challenge. Starting back in 1981, for those of you who aren't as old as I am, that's Dr. Howard and Georgiana Jones sharing a desk as they tried to figure out the uh, mysteries of the pituitary and go on to create the first IVF child in the United States. The picture on the right is myself at a conference in 2017 where I had the honor of meeting Louise Brown on the left and Elizabeth Carr, who I already knew, the first IVF babies from the UK and the United States, 1978 and 1981. So there's lots of things we cryopreserve these days. It used to be only sperm. We voluntarily had cryopreservation, and then there has been for years extraction from incompetent or deceased men. There's the freezing of embryos for intended parents with or without donor gametes. Uh, fast forward, we now freeze eggs routinely for both patients, intended mothers, and egg donors ovarian tissue for minors and the future, you all will tell me what's coming around the corner. I won't even begin to guess. So the first of my three topics is just let's take a look at what I think is accurately called pre-implantation IVF embryos. It's a mouthful, but there's a lot of misuse of language in this field. And I think it's important to be accurate when we talk interprofessionally. And one of my goals this evening is to give you an idea of why some of the things that we talk about and do have significant impact in the law and how we can steer that hopefully in a more sensitive and professional direction. So as I said, we're not gonna do my class except for about a three minute uh, flyover. And what I wanna start with are the, what I call the divorcing embryo cases. There is one seminal case, and then there are three cases from the past few years. And I wanna just ask very bluntly, is there a legal bottom line on frozen embryos? With respect to other issues, there are mix-ups, transport and tank failures, and I want to pose the question of whether there's a safer way to practice art. A lot of you say, stop scaring me, Susan. I hate it when you talk. I have to go grab the Ativan. So my goal is really to give you some pointers as well as some insights. The very first frozen embryo case happened in 1992 in Tennessee. And the holding, what the court ruled, is really critically important to remember. And it was remarkably prescient because what they said is we conclude that pre-embryos, and that was the term they chose, are not strictly speaking either persons or property, but occupy an interim category that entitles them to special respect because of their potential for life. And that's important. And the reason it's important, excuse me one second, I just have to fix my screen. Um, there we go. Is because if you look at those words, especially the ones I've highlighted, there's some critically 
important values there that have carried forward. Pre-embryos, whether you like or dislike the term, keep in mind it is a distinguishing feature between a conceptus, a child, a fetus. They are not property or persons. The interim category of special respect isn't because they are human life, and we'll get to personhood initiatives in a minute, but because of the potential they have to become human life. This is a direct quote from the very first ethics committee of the American Fertility Society, now ASRM, convened. The court ruled that in the absence of an agreement, and there was no agreement, unfortunately, because the clinic had moved its offices and hadn't unpacked its consent forms. And what they said was in the absence of a signature and an agreement, the husband's constitutional right not to procreate overrides the wife's interest in procreating and ordered the pre-embryos discarded. So the potential for human life and special respect does not mean you cannot discard an IVF pre-implantation embryo. This is a busy slide, bottom line. From a legal perspective, an, an embryo is a fertilized egg less than 14 days before the primitive streak has um, appeared. That's important because that's individuation and will become important. We know that IVF embryos have hit the lightning rod of abortion in this country and that there are legal, religious, and philo philosophical differences. We know that under Roe v. Wade still, life begins at viability and that an IVF pre-implantation embryo does not meet that definition. We, a lot of us worry about what's going to happen in this day and age. The fact that there was a recent decision, I don't think necessarily gives us a lot of comfort. As some analysts have said, it was clear the votes were there and the case may be waiting for another day. Courts and legislatures have almost uniformly recognized that an embryo is a unique entity. They use different language, pre-embryo, zygote, fertilized egg, they talk about joint marital property, which is important to realize because it's not the same as regular property. Joint or marital property or property of a special character, depending on the state law, means usually you can't just, you can't put it, slice it in half, you can't give it to one or the other. Louisiana is a state that has always been an outlier and it actually recognizes an IVF embryo as a juridical person, and we'll get to that in a minute as well. And I've already given you my preferred language. So, what do we know from all of the cases? What we know, I think, is the following, that there have been over 20 state appellate courts that have looked at the issue of what to do about frozen embryos and divorce disputes since Davis. Every one of them has characterized frozen embryos as unique, using different language, whether it was chosen by the court, offered by the witnesses, or based on state law. But generally, when they analyze the question of what to do, it falls into three categories. Is it a contract and decided under contract law? Shall we balance the interests of this ex-husband and wife, especially if there wasn't a contract or documentation like in Davis? Or should we insist on contemporaneous consent, which is my favorite, least favorite option since I've never seen a divorcing couple who have taken the time, money, and emotional grief to go into court to be able to agree on this question. Interestingly, there has not been an appellate court that has allowed procreation over the ex-spouse's objection, no matter what the documents said. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. So with that, what I want to do is just focus on three cases that have happened in the last two years and tell you why I thought they were worth discussing this evening, because each has a takeaway point. So in 2018, the Colorado case of in re marriage of Rooks involved a divorcing couple with six frozen embryos, and they already had three children. Unfortunately, the clinic had somehow decided or someone had helped them write that the dispositional decision would be made at the time of divorce, not the best time to find people in agreement. The Colorado Supreme Court then said, well, we don't have a written record. So like Davis, we are going to balance the constitutional rights and decide what we should do. And they recognize the special status of the pre-embryo. Well, the wife in the Thomas More Society, which is a society that is supporting a lot of anti-abortion efforts in the courts, lost the case and petitioned the Supreme Court of the United States and argued that, quote, science is firm on when a person comes into being, which was news to me. Embryos aren't property, nor are they in an in-between classification. Again, news to the 20 courts that have decided else otherwise. Three, the court, meaning the Supreme Court, must decide the most basic human question, is a human embryo a person or property? A binary decision they wanted to force, which no court had looked at, and then argued that this has to be decided on a national level. I can tell you a lot of us were very nervous 
and very relieved when the Supreme Court decided to deny the petition for certiorari and refuse to take the case. But that question is likely to come back up again by another litigant with another support from the Thomas More Society to a very conservative court. The second of the three cases is um, one of my favorite cases to hate. It was, this happened in 2019, Therese versus Terrell. This was a couple who were engaged, not married. The woman was diagnosed with breast cancer, so they quickly did an IVF cycle, created frozen embryos, married, and divorced. The IVF documents said that upon divorce, the couple had chosen to have a court decree or settlement for one of us to use and otherwise donate to another couple. And then there was a note that said, no use by either without joint consent. The couple had chosen donate to another couple unless they agreed otherwise. So the lower court read the documents, read them correctly and said, this requires donation. The Arizona court threw a huge monkey wrench into this and stepped way into the breach because they felt very badly for Ruby Torres, a cancer survivor. And what they did is they passed this statute that basically nullifies any documents an IVF program would write. And what they said is that at a time of divorce, the court shall give the embryo to the spouse who wants to bring them to birth. If both of them provided their gametes, then resolve any dispute if they both want them to the one who will provide the best chance for them to develop to birth. And if only one spouse provided the gametes, then that spouse gets them. B is critical, regardless of the couple's agreement, which means no matter how carefully you draft any of the documents for your clinic, if you're in Arizona, I don't think any of it matters. The other spouse is relieved of all parental responsibilities unless they choose to have them. Because this law is not retroactive, it doesn't help Ruby Torres. So she went on to appeal. And sure enough, the intermediate appellate court reversed. And they said, no, you know what? That note in the documents actually says that the court should balance interests. They ignored the other part that said we agree to donate unless we agree otherwise and ordered the wife to get them. The Arizona Supreme Court on appeal reversed the appeals court and said their analysis was simply wrong. The note does not negate the choice they made and reaffirm the trial court order to donate the embryos. Like the Davis case, this gives you an example of how tortured these cases are and how many levels they go through. The third and last case I want to mention to you is one out of Connecticut last year. Divorced couple signed a consent and they had chose, chosen discard. At the time of divorce, the husband changed his mind. He hoped that they would reconcile, and if not, he wanted to donate them. The Connecticut Supreme Court said, no, this is a contract, and we're going to approach it as a contract, and went on with some very helpful language, saying honoring couples' directives provides practical certainty for clinics, it reduces the likelihood of abandoned embryos, and it ensures that clinics are able to satisfy their ethical obligations. There is a big caveat, however, and the court said, please note, we are not deciding two things. If the choice the couple had made was to procreate, we are not deciding if that was enforceable or would have been against public policy. And secondly, if there had been an agreement, how we would balance their interests. So they have still left this question mark for us to ponder about what happens with an agreement where it had been that one could use and the other then objects. Another interesting development that I don't have any idea how it will turn out, I just wanted to mention, is that New Jersey decided to create a lab regulation law. It's supposed to be effective in January 2021 and is hoping to step into what they consider a breach of embryo labs, uh, IVF labs, and do some regulation. I think it will be interesting for all of us to watch what happens with that. Um, takeaways. I told you I would try to give you an idea of safer art. I think there's a couple on this uh, area. One, IVF embryos are going to continue to trigger anti-abortion sentiments, efforts, litigation, and legislation. There are a tremendous number of personhood legislative initiatives that are filed all the time. They haven't been successful, but they haven't gone away either. There are unintended consequences for those uh, statutes if they were to pass on art, and they're real. In other words, it said life begins at fertilization. If I were an IVF doctor, I'd be shaking in my boots, wondering whether or not I could even proceed without being at risk of violating that statute. The other thing is that lower courts are often sympathetic to procreative loss, especially oncofertility, um, women who've, who've experienced cancer, and yet the courts of final resort are much more rule and law bound. The other thing I would point out to you without going through all the cases to try to prove it is that they are very cognizant of medical data and facts, terminology, explanations. So as much as I imagine many of you hate court, I would say if you're asked to be an expert witness, think about it because educating and advocacy can be a very important part of your role 
and can end up being really critical to shaping the law. So what should you do? I would say keep in mind the Thomas More Society and other anti-IVF, anti-abortion groups are alive and well. I would make sure that your documents are absolutely as clear as you can be. Informed consent is critical. As you know, it's a dialogue, it's a q and A. It it is not a document. On the other hand, you need these documents. And I think in SART, we, I've been on the committee where we have produced and updated these multiple times. Separate documents are the norm now, one for treatment, which is a consent, and one for disposition styled as a contract or agreement. In the contract for disposition, SART recommends, and I think it's a great recommendation that there is an automatic default disposition. In other words, I might want them to go to my first cousin, my best friend, my husband, whatever, but if I can't have what I want at the time it's time to do it, I authorize discard. What that does is it takes you out of the abandonment loop and gives you the authorization to actually discard embryos. Anything has to be compliant with local law and there's certainly some factors you're gonna to wanna to consider. Um, are there alternatives? I think this is the more interesting question, frankly. I hear of clinics who are starting to do short-term storage requirements and make it someone else's problem. You must ship out to a short to a facility after X number of months or years. I think there's a sweet spot potentially. I was I worry when I hear shipping out in six months because I think patients are still using those embryos. I think there's an even more interesting question about whether or not freezing gametes separately, sperm and eggs versus embryos, is a way out of these embryo disputes. We're going to talk about that in a minute minute, but I want to be clear that protocols are important and counseling is critical. The, I already mentioned the SART model consent forms. I assume you're all aware of them, and this is just an expanded version. And in the interest of time, if you want in the q and I'll come back to it. But I'll just say I think they are a good starting point for any program. Whenever you're part of a profession or industry and there is a standard that's been set, it's going to, at a minimum, be a floor for liability. So I would not ignore it. Take it to your local lawyers, tailor it to your program. What's a clinic to do? I mentioned short-term storage. I do think you have to weigh the risks and benefits, whether or not you make it optional or mandatory. If you make it mandatory, you're gonna have more responsibilities. In other words, do they have to ship out to your particular place, use your forms, use your carriers? Almost jokingly, but seriously, I will tell you, I wouldn't ship during ASRM. I've actually had two cases I consulted on where embryos were damaged and lost in transit. Why, I don't know, but it, in both cases, the senior embryologist was at ASRM and the lab was being overseen by a junior. This question of freezing gametes, I think, does something very important. It protects patients' autonomy. For women who, who 10, 15, 20 years ago could not have this option, they now can. Again, I think the risks and benefits need to be weighed. And I think it's really complicated in this sense. I think if people have been doing this for a very long time, there's a default in many people's minds, physicians, let's freeze embryos for happily married couples. But we all have just seen how many happily married couples end up in divorce court, 50% rate in the United States without throwing in these challenges. So if you freeze gametes separately, you have preserved individual options. It presents counseling challenges. The last thing you want to say to a couple facing cancer treatment is, by the way, you might split up, so let's not freeze embryos. And there are ways to do it. But I think that you have to be very cognizant that this is an alternative. I want to briefly talk about a lot of other the fact that there are other embryo issues on the table and then move on to the other two topics in the time that's left. So first of all, embryos and non-divorce, um, I've already mentioned the critical role of language. Abandonment comes up on almost every talk I have. And people say, well, when can we decide embryos are abandoned and when can we actually throw them out without worrying about it? And the first thing I tell them is, I don't know if your embryos are abandoned and I don't think you do until you have pulled out the consent forms and the documents and any agreements and fine tooth comb them with a lawyer. And I have found more often than not that these embryos aren't abandoned. That in fact, the patients have said, if we lose contact, if we fail to pay, if we don't do X, Y, or Z, we authorize you to discard them. And if you don't do it, I think you have as much risk of liability as if you do. Embryo donation is important to distinguish from embryo adoption. If you were talking about adoption, you're talking about living children and you have just bought into the anti-abortion uh, language that is being asked for. Transfer, there's a funny case in which the court said, we don't know whether you meant transfer into the woman's uterus or transfer from husband to wife. You need to be more precise. There are issues around tank failures and resultant losses, mix-ups and disputes over parentage. We've talked about gamete freezing, and I want to look at the last couple of issues around reproductive genetics and posthumous reproduction. 
along with a quick talk on surrogacy. So I'm gonna speed up a little bit in the interest of making sure that we both finish on time and have time for questions. I'm sure nobody listening to this call is unaware that on the exact same weekend, there were tank failures in California and Ohio. It was a remarkable uh, double black swan event. As some people have called it, thousands of gametes and embryos were thawed. Many of them were destroyed, not all. The point I wanna make from a legal perspective is that obviously there were multiple lawsuits filed. Most of them settled. Most of them were brought on a tort basis, which is a civil claim for something that's been lost that is akin to property. And go back to what I said before, that they're entitled to special respect, but they are entities and there is some value that can be placed on them. An outlier was at least one, and I think now two Ohio couples who sued for wrongful death, trying to argue that their embryos were actually frozen children. The appellate court rejected those theory and said, these are property, not persons. Once again, we see that same issue coming up. In terms of damages, it's gonna depend completely on the value. Donor gametes that can be replaced are gonna have, a, 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 you can put a numerical um, number on them. Oncofertility patients for whom this was their last chance at genetic parenthood is obviously going to be a much more serious and much more uh, highly valued loss. With respect to mix-ups, I'm just going to tell you that they happen. Um, mix-ups of gametes and mix-ups of embryos, they have happened from the beginning of time and they continue through to this year. And there are probably many more that we don't hear about um, based on settlements. So we're not gonna spend time on these. Anyone who's interested can in ask me during the Q&A. This is a really busy slide, but I think it's exciting because in some ways it shows there's been a lot of movement in the field. The personhood statutes I mentioned to you have not gone in very far but there have been seven of them filed since 2019, and that scares me a lot. They basically say life begins at the earliest point. Some of them define it as fertilization. The only one that says this is not to be construed to prohibit IVF is South Carolina. And they, all of the others, it's clearly going to impact it if they ever were to pass. I already told you that in 2019, Arizona came up with this idea to give IVF embryos to the one who's gonna bring them to birth and override any of your consents or um, contracts. And Louisiana has always had a statute that amazes me that basically says a viable IVF human ovum, meaning an embryo in their point, is a juridical person, and that leftover embryos are available for adoptive implantation only by the way to heterosexual married couples, and the physician is the temporary guardian of that embryo. So congratulations to all of you who thought you were through with your childbearing years. You may in fact be the parent of everything in your tanks in Louisiana. On a positive note, the fertility preservation statutes have actually been rocketing through the state legislatures. Since 2017, nine states have passed mandates ensuring coverage of medical procedures to preserve reproductive tissue. And I think it's just remarkable in this day of stalemates that we've seen that type of law being introduced and enacted. So is egg freezing the answer? Um, this is just an example. It actually is taken from somebody who spoke to you all a few years ago. And the bottom line on this is that Rebecca, I mean, I've changed the names to protect the, you know, the victims here, was a 31-year-old with breast cancer diagnosis, came into an office with her husband. They'd been married. They had a child. To all intents and purposes, they appeared to be a happily married couple. And she was facing breast cancer and immediately needed IVF. So what would you do? Some doctors will tell me they would counsel them as a couple, get them in for an IVF cycle and freeze their embryos. Why? Because that's what we've always done. What does the law say? The law says that embryos, as we've discussed, are under joint control, that genetics may be weighted very heavily, that eggs instead of embryos belong to a single person, and that the spouse partner has been given veto power in almost every case we've seen. And that's why I think we need to look at, at offering egg freezing, especially as it becomes more and more routine. Um, I think when I hear doctors say, but they, we don't do it as well, I think there's a second challenge in here, which is that I think there could be liability for not offering this. And I think that if you um, think that it's an option, it should be offered. Okay, moving on. Let's talk about what's around the legal corner. Um, two things. Reproductive genetics, I think, is exploding. And surrogacy has had a couple of very significant developments. So Genetic time bombs was an expression used by a court that said basically, if you, the parent, can't figure out genetically the implication of something until later on, that two or three year statute of limitations doesn't start until you can find out. The facts of the case in there were really interesting. Child was born and the mother knew something was wrong. The doctors missed the diagnosis of Fragile X. 
based on their representation that there were no genetic issues, she had child number two with the exact same condition. When she turned to sue, the court said, you know, the uh, doctors defended and said, sorry, this child was six years ago and the statute of limitations is three. She went back to court and said, you know what? I didn't know until child number two was born and the court said, that's right. So I worry a lot about what happens about these cases where we're now doing genetic testing under one standard. It's tremendously expanded from what we did yesterday, two years ago, five years ago, and probably nothing compared to what we're gonna be doing in the future. So how are we going to know how to update this information? Who's gonna have that responsibility and what types of liability follow? Clearly we have documents that say, this is a snapshot in time, we can't be responsible for the future. But I still wonder what happens if we hear about a child who's born with a genetic anomaly, how and do we trace back to all the other donor offspring and to the donor and to their children. On surrogacy, I wanna talk briefly about two developments. One is that New York after 10 years has finally passed the Child Parent Security Act and now compensated surrogacy is legal in that state. I'm gonna skip the details in the interest of time. I'm just going to say that it was a Herculean effort by a lot of people over multiple years. Um, there are some key non-surrogacy elements and single women can be recognized as a sole legal parent. Consent should be in a written record. Everyone has to have signed off on this before you begin any medical procedures and everyone has a right to terminate any time before a pregnancy has been established. The surrogate has the right to make all of her own healthcare decisions and to request and receive counseling paid for by the intended parents as well as an attorney. Let's take a really quick look at international surrogacy and what's happened in the COVID world. As with all surrogacy, there's, the vulnerabilities tend to be around the contract, the parentage, and the physical custody questions. International surrogacy adds a lot of complexities because you have to worry about immigration, citizenship, travel, and coordinating. In the old days, you would get a pre-birth order in the US. The international parents would arrive for, for the birth. A passport would issue here in America. There'd be a routine embassy visit and the family would fly home and live happily ever after. It's been dramatically exacerbated since COVID. The questions include getting these foreign intended parents into the US given the travel ban. The next question is how do we get these US born babies home to their parents when the world around us is shut down? And the really interesting question, I think, is how do we care for these kids while we figure all of this out? So here are some of the solutions that are Band-Aids, it seems to me. We're getting foreign IPs into the US through circuitous routes. They're quarantining en route. They're trying to find a country that has not been banned. How they're getting kids home has become a nightmare. Extraordinary efforts by lawyers, both here and in the home countries, there have been um, papers signed in parking lots when the courts are closed. There have been emergency travel documents issues. There's something called laissez-passer, which some countries recognize, which is letting you pass through the country. There have been workarounds reported from Serbia, Australia, France, and the UK, among others. They can require consular visits, birth certificates. And this question of who cares for the babies has become very difficult because there are risks to the baby, there are risks to the carrier, there are risks to the family, there are risks to the intended parents. People are worried about having the carriers without a, any type of a guardianship. They're worried about giving a guardianship to the carrier. There's a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking where people are trying to scramble to find legal custodians in the country temporarily. So what's happening now, everyone's amending their contracts. They're looking forward. And I think that some of these issues are, were predictable, but not in the degree. There's always been a risk that an international parent will not arrive. I had one of the earliest cases, it was a nightmare. There has to be pre-planning for physical and legal custody of any of these kids. And to my mind, it should have been a part of every international surrogacy arrangement in the beginning. You need to have a temporary guardian named in the country and you need the money to cover the cost of that care. We need new contracts to cover all of this and we're starting to see it come up. This is a busy slide. Basically, the government isn't helping. Um, as of July 6th, there were only four passport offices open in phase tw uh, two, two centers in phase one. And here's the real problem. The emergency visas are only available to a parent or legal guardian of a U.S. citizen. And a baby who has not yet been born, even though they will be a citizen at birth, is not a citizen. So the passport offices are not cooperating and not being helpful pre-birth which means that all of this becomes an emergency and all the problems I described are happening. So that's the big problem. 
passports for surrogacy babies. The U.S. has restricted the issuance of these since March. They're only issued for qualified life or death. They're finding none of this qualifies, and the usual protocol is just not happening. We don't know when the offices are going to open. It seems like the workarounds are getting slightly more predictably helpful. There are, excuse me, that is my, my sign that I have two minutes left. So I did not want to overstay my welcome. Um, we have seen some, uh, I've heard of some programs where actually former surrogates have offered to bring home babies who were not those that they delivered. There's some very creative things happening, but it's not being helped by the government and it continues to be a major challenge. The egg donor issues with COVID are also cropping up. The informed consents are needing to be amended and tailored. It's clear you can't or shouldn't hold a donor liable for contract breach for a specific time to undergo evaluations and retrievals if she can't get there, if programs are closed or if travel is dangerous, so people are extending the time periods. There are also hold harmless provisions people are adding into their contracts that say if a donor, if a donor turns out to have COVID-19 as long as she was not aware of or did not take unreasonable risks, she should not be liable for that an agreement to follow all the restrictions the government and CDC recommendations. And there are lots of individualized tra travel issues around uh, money, time, restrictions, and everyone I think is sort of scrambling to customize this. So it's another sort of COVID vulnerability, if you will. My last topic tonight was simply going to be posthumous reproduction. I just have to pause and say, this was a topic I spoke to NEFS about probably 15 years ago in person. And I still remember because two of the nurses came up and said, you think you've got stories. Let me tell you what happened in our program. So the only thing I want to mention to you that I think is new, and I will end on this, is that finally the Supreme Court has told us that a child-parent relationship is defined by a state law. So the questions that you all face, I think, are around access and use. Do you extract sperm and do you, how do you release stored tissue? and the legal parent-child status is gonna be resolved by state court. And that's what this says. Um, there's a case that was very sad last year. I imagine a lot of you heard about it where parents of a young single West Point cadet were allowed to retrieve his sperm after he was killed in a ski accident. There was absolutely nothing in writing. There was nothing that indicated he would have wanted this. All they could tell the court and the professionals was, that he was, he loved a large family. He talked about wanting one someday and he was their only child and they wanted to preserve his sperm and find a surrogate. The court was sympathetic and said, yes, ASRM has produced an ethics opinion that basically says you may but need not follow the request of a surviving life partner and you should give adequate time for grieving. And they pose what I think are some really important questions. Is there a right to reproduce posthumously? And the one that I focus on a lot is, is there a right to avoid posthumous reproduction? You know, I just don't know that, that young cadet ever anticipated that there, he would be a, a dead dad, as I call them. So I want to end on that note, I think, so that we can move on to questions. My final two slides were just what else is coming. The 2017 discovery of artificial wombs in uh, Philadelphia really, really makes me wonder what reproductive rights and ART are going to look like in the future, because if we're able to replicate this for living human IVF embryos and fetuses, then I think everything that we've thought about reproductive rights and women's autonomy becomes reduced to which one of you has the right to turn on or off the switch, or does a third person have that opportunity? In uh, the Women's March in 2017, one of my favorite signs was, thou shalt not mess with a woman's reproductive rights, quoting Fallopians 1.21. I think that's in the Old Testament, I'm not sure, but I think we are messing with women's reproductive rights a lot, and I don't know exactly where we're gonna come out. I do think we're in this together. I appreciate you taking the time to listen. Please stay safe, healthy, and sane, and I'm happy to at least try to answer questions and talk with you all. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. I always, I always find these such interesting topics, so thank you. So our first question is, how does a lower court state law affect other states in general and in medicine particularly? And the second part of that, what is the chance that the Arizona court decision stays an anomaly? Great two questions. So a lower state court has zero application to any other state. And in fact, the highest state court has zero application to any other state. The only reason we talk about them is because there is such a paucity of law in this area 
and always has been that courts are almost invariably saying, here's what my sister court said, here's what my brother court said in this state, and they don't necessarily follow them. So it's important to understand the parameters, you know, the three theories, et cetera, of how we decide the debates, but no state court is going to um, be followed outside of its state. As far as the Arizona statute goes, it's, I hope it's an anomaly. I don't really think it's workable. I've talked to some of the Arizona clinics about bringing a test case. I think it violates the constitutional rights of their patients, and I don't see how doctors can practice with it. I haven't seen it happen yet, but I would like to bring that challenge, and I think it would be worth bringing. Um, I actually made a sort of sick joke about this when I was interviewed, and I said, you know, if you were really trying to help Ruby Torres, you did the exact opposite, because the person who has the best chance of bringing those embryos to life is the husband with his healthy second wife or any surrogate he wants to hire, and she's going to be sorry out of luck, and you didn't even help her. So I hope it's an anomaly. We'll see. We have a second question for you. Do you foresee ramifications from the burgeoning number of frozen embryos resulting from the current treatment paradigms that contribute to the single embryo transfer freeze-all cycles and PGTA cycles? Um, it's an interesting question. I hope that instead what we're going to have is better consent forms and disposition documents that say what people want to have done with those embryos so that we will we may have more, but we aren't going to have a lack of instruction. I think in the, in the dark ages when we all started, nobody thought about the fact that embryos might be staying in freezers for a long time. And so a lot of times the, there was not the kind of clarity around what to do with embryos. We've learned our lessons, or at least I hope we have. In those couple of cases I put at the beginning, we're supposed to illustrate that if your documents don't yet say default, discard, go back and re revise them. So that I think is going to happen. I'm actually more intrigued by the idea of what happens to all of these women who are freezing their eggs and don't use them and, and what's going to happen there. Right, so actually on that topic, um, Kate from New England um, Resolve has a question. Um, in terms of the egg embryo freezing, couldn't some couples do both so they would have more options in the future or is that really just opening it up to more more? It's a great Kate, it's a great question, and it comes up a lot <clears throat> when we have this debate over whether or not a couple should freeze embryos egg, or eggs. And what most of the medical professionals tell me is that it's sort of kicking the can down the road for two reasons. One, the embryos are still going to be subject to a fight, and so all you've done is fighting over 50%. And secondly, you're probably not going to get that many eggs or embryos from a couple who are in this position of a quick cycle before cancer treatment. So I think it has superficial appeal, but I think it doesn't actually address the problem in a way that is um, helpful to the patients. We have one more question. Uh, the SART model consent forms are very thoughtful and smart and provide clinics uh, to make their own changes. Is there a way to, to compare those specific clinic changes from time to time? This way the model consents may improve over time. I'm not sure I understand the question. Is there a way for SART to look at the individual changes that programs have made and see whether they want to incorporate them into the future? Is I that believe that's okay? That's if what I, the question is, I think it's a great idea. I do not know if there is a formal mechanism, but Jim Toner is the chair of that committee, and he's the most accessible person I've ever met. And what I would say to anybody is, either a send in your forms to Jim and say, here are some things that you might want to consider or suggest to him that he actually invite people to do it. I know that based on the committee, which includes a number of people from programs, we have continually brought in language that people have used in order to try to improve the form. So I would say it takes a village and absolutely um, send them in. And if you want, suggest that that be you know, uh, made more explicit. I think you have sufficiently frightened us all now, Susan. Um, no. That's usually how I feel at the end of your talk. Enlightened and frightened at the same time. <laughs> no, I gave you ways to practice safer art. <laughs> or at least I tried to. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much.
Um, we have a few closing remarks. Um, so if people could just stay with us for a couple of minutes. Um, I'd like to take the take a minute to give a big shout out to the founders of the um, International IVF Initiative, Dr. Jacques Cohen, Dr. Peter Naj, Thomas Elliott, Shasta Sarudin, Marianne uh, Savatez, um, Giles Palmer. Thank you for the wisdom and ambition to start this invaluable platform and for allowing the New England Fertility Society to partake of it. Additionally, I'd like to thank the New England Fertility Society Executive Committee, and in particular, Evelyn Neuber and Michelle Pitcher, who worked uh, so hard to make the partnership with I3 a reality this evening. Also, thank you to the New England Fertility Society industry sponsors, who, without whose support, we would not be able to um, provide any educational um, endeavors. Um, so audience, please join me in giving a big virtual um, applause to the I3 founders and the New England Fertility Society executive board and sponsors. Thank you all. Um, I'd like to encourage you um, again to contact I3 if you would like to help create or submit some website content um, through their website or to email them. Um, you can contact them at contact at ivfmeeting.com. Um, the group at I3 has been a pleasure to work with um, and they have made this event uh, very easy for those of us at New England Fertility Society. If you represent a professional organization, please help spread the word and um, let them know that I3, uh, let I3 know if you would like to host a session um, of your own topic, even in your own language. Um, I3's aim is to have this operation active continuously to maximize the value to the reproductive healthcare community. Thank you again to our speakers, Andrea Braverman and Susan Kraken. I would also like to give a big shout out to our audience for showing up um, on a mid-July evening um, at all hours of the day from all corners of the world um, and asking some fantastic questions. Um, those that weren't presented um, live will be um, sent to the speakers and will be posted. Um, so thank you for keeping the conversation stimulating. We appreciate all your support. Um, and finally, just a few reminders. The recording of this meeting will be available on the I3 website shortly. Um, for laboratory staff who are seeking to obtain credits, you may print out your certificate from this meeting and submit it to ABB. For physicians and nurses, you will receive an evaluation by email following this meeting that will need to be completed and returned. Um, alternately, you can go to the www.nefs um, website and click on the virtual meeting page to obtain an evaluation form um, and to return that. Um, and lastly, uh, the 25th I3 session will be held next week, um, Tuesday, July 21st at 3 p.m. Um, GMT, 9 p.m. CMT, and 3 p.m., excuse me, 8 p.m. GMT, 9 p.m. CMT, and 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The session will be hosted by Alpha and is entitled, How to Keep Gametes and Embryos from Environmental Harm. The moderators will be um, Sharon Mortimer and Mina Alakani. Presentations will be from David Gardner, David Mortimer, and Linda Gudice. Hopefully you'll be able to attend that or future meetings of I3 and the New England Fertility Society. We thank you all for your attention. Have a good night. <laughs>